Good morning, church. Good morning. Happy Palm Sunday. Happy Mary's Day. Um, I thank the Lord. Um, I'm also grateful to the Mother's Union Authority, especially to Mrs. Sylvie, the chairperson, for giving me the, for the trust, I mean, for trusting me and uh, giving me this opportunity to share the word. And I'm also grateful to God for giving me the opportunity to talk about Jesus. And yeah, so thank you very much. Yes. Uh, can we pray first? Father, we thank you. We delight in you. And we are grateful for this time. It is amazing that these Bibles we are holding, even though we can read them just like letters, those letters are not just dead letters, those letters are your own word. So this morning as we open up the Bible, Lord, we pray that our heart will be ready to hear you. Lord, we pray that you speak to our hearts, O oh Lord. Correct us, train us in our righteousness, rebuke us, beat us up, strengthen us, and forgive us. So we thank you, and we are here to hear from you, Lord. We are open to you, in the name of Jesus, amen. So, um, today we have um, a special topic, as Mrs. Sylvie said, to serve the Lord with gladness or joyfully. And um, we'll be looking at this topic from the book of Philippians and Psalm 100, as uh, we read. But I would like to call your attention on the book of Philippians. It's amazing that this book, it's the book in the New Testament, actually it's the, it, it's the book that talks about joy more than any other book in the New Testament. And what is amazing about it is the background or the context in which Paul is writing this letter. Paul in his prison, he's in prison, custody in Rome, and death is a possibility. They might behead him anytime. And he knows that quite well. And again, the Philippians, or the church in, Philipp in Philippi, is also facing trials, persecution, opposition, false teachers, and disunity. And what is amazing is to hear Paul talking about joy in such situation. So thank you for choosing Philippians. It's the right book to tell us how we can serve the Lord joyfully with gladness, even in the worst situations. Hallelujah. And our question actually is, when Paul is saying, I'm happy, I'm joyful, and you Philippians also rejoice in the Lord, the question is, why should they rejoice? Since there is nothing to be happy about. The situation is not good at all. Why should Paul rejoice? Why should they rejoice? So, the sermon is going to try to actually respond to that question. What is the source of our joy? when we are serving the Lord? That's the question. So if I start with uh, Psalm 100, 
it's a very small uh, sum because it has only five verses. So in sum, verse 1, 2, and 3, and 4, sorry, the writer is giving us a command. So I'm using NIV. If what I'm saying, I'm saying some different words than what different words than what you have in your Bibles, it's fine. I'm using NIV version. So the writer in verse one, verse two, and verse four is giving us a command. He's saying, shout for joy. I like this. Like shout. Be happy. Shout. And then he's saying, worship the Lord with gladness. Again, sing joyful songs to him. Thank him. Come with thanksgiving into his house. Praise, sing praises to him. It is a command. He's not saying maybe or consider. It's a command. Do that. Shout for joy. Be happy. And then, on verse 3 and 5, he actually gives us the secret or the source of that joy. It's not it's not just trying to be happy. There is a reason why we should be happy. There is a source of happiness. And that's what he's telling us on verse 3 and 5. Verse 3 starts this way. Know that. In other words, shout for joy. Be happy. Because of this. Know that. Be sure of this. And then be happy. And then shout. Know that. Then on verse 5, he starts with, shout to the Lord, rejoice to the Lord. For, the word for means because. There is a reason why we should shout for joy. And when he has introduced verse 3 and verse 5 that way, then he describes who this Lord we are to shout joy for is who is this lord and then he talks about what he has done so in other words he's telling us your joy you will be happy you'll be joyful you will shout for joy when you know this lord when you know what he has done joy will be there Hallelujah. You will be happy. Happiness will be a must, not an option. You will be happy. And then he goes on describing who is this Lord. And for the sake of time, I don't want to say everything I prepared, but anyway, the Lord will be good to us. <laughs> who is the Lord? I want you to understand very well when I talk about the Lord, because this psalm so talks about shouting for the Lord, the Lord, the Lord. The Lord is everywhere. But I want us to understand who is this Lord they are talking about. The children, before they sang, they, they, sang, they said, from Genesis up to resurrection, the Bible talks about Jesus. And I want to, first of all, Make sure, that, make sure that you understand Psalm 100 talks about the Lord Jesus and what he has done for us. So in Philippians 2, verse 11, it's written, every tongue, every tongue will acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. So when I say Lord, understand Jesus. Are we together? So this Lord is Jesus. Now, on verse 3, they actually describe Jesus in 
six, um, in six, yeah, there, there is six descriptions of this road, but I will take just like three because of time. Only three. You will bear with me. Well, so on verse three, they say the Lord or Jesus is God. Hallelujah. So the Lord we serve and the Lord we shall rejoice in is God. In other words, he is above everything. He has everything. He rules everything. So we, he is in control of everything. So this is the Jesus we serve. Sometimes we forget. Imagine serving a Lord like him. Total control. Total control. Even the worst time. And we are going to look at Paul, how he, was, he would rejoice even in prison. Because he had understood that the Lord is God. Caesar is not God. He will only kill him if God allows. If God does not allow, he won't be killed. He knows even if he's in prison, God is in control. He's at peace. God is in control. Hallelujah. And then on verse 3 again, they say, the Lord is our shepherd. Jesus is our shepherd. And we know that in John 11, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lies down his life for the sheep. He died for us. His blood brought us peace and forgiveness and redemption. He is our shepherd. And then on verse 28, it says, I give them eternal life. He gives us eternal life. And they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. That's why Paul would rejoice. He knew death was not a threat because he could not take away the eternal life Jesus had given him. He could not be separated from God. No way. No one could snatch him out of God's hand. It was impossible. And then on verse 5, they say, the Lord is good. In other words, Jesus is good. There is a friend of mine, once we were praying and reading the Bible, and then we were meditating, and then he asked me a question. Alice, if God was, I mean, if God, if there was a possibility that God can be, can die, what what would kill him? And I was like, I, I don't know. I don't know. But then he told me something. If God was to die, Goya kichkwa ono kujiraneza. Kuko ajiraneza virenzi. I want to say some few things about the goodness of the Lord. He said if God was to die, he would be killed by his own goodness because he's too much goodness. Good, I'm sorry. He's too much good. And we don't deserve his goodness. The Lord is God. When I read Ephesians 1. I'm all, always like, I just don't understand. Why would God do this? He has been good in forgiving us with the cost of his own blood, life, like he suffered for real. But forgiveness, it's good, right? If, if you are forgiven, you feel good, you have peace, no guilt. That's amazing. If someone can forgive you. Forgiveness is so, it's not something you can buy with money. 
But that was not, he didn't stop by forgiving us. He said, I will even redeem you. In other words, yes, you have sinned, I've forgiven you, but also I'm giving you power over sin. You can overcome any sin in your life by my power. He didn't stop by that. He said, you know what? I will e even give you my own righteousness. So that when God looks at me, he doesn't see me at least who is messy, but he sees the beauty, the holiness, the blame, blaze, blame, blame, blameless, the blaze, blame, you know, you can understand. You see, he sees the holiness and the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Can you imagine? What did you pay for you to go in front of God with confidence? Knowing all your sins and my sins. And then we can stand in front of him. He didn't stop there. He said, I will make you daughters and sons of the Almighty. What did we pay? Sons and daughters. And he didn't stop there. He said, I will make you heirs of the kingdom of heaven. I'm a heir of the kingdom of heaven. Sometimes we look at us, we look at the society, we see the inequalities and disrespect, social status. Ariko, we have a new identity. We're not poor. We are rich because we are heirs of the kingdom of heaven. He has been good to us. He has been so good good to us. The Lord has been good. Let me go into the life of Paul. I want us to look at three verses in Philippians that shows us how Paul had grasped, had understood Jesus and the gospel, I mean, the message about Jesus saving us and being good to us, that he would even rejoice in the prison. The joy of serving the Lord in the life of Paul. So allow me to read uh, Philippians 1.21. So I'm sorry, I'm going through Philippians. <laughs> so I didn't just pick Philippians uh, 4, chapter 4. So Philippians 1.20. Paul said... To, for to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. To live is who? Christ. To die is gain. Remember, he is in prison. Remember, he can die any time. And then he's saying, to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. In other words, he's saying, if I escape a life, I'll be happy. Because there will be an opportunity for me to spread this gospel about Jesus Christ, my Lord. I will let people know there is salvation in Jesus Christ. And he's saying, if I'm killed, if I die... It will not only be a testimony of Christ to, to Christ Jesus, but also I'll be happy because I will go and see my Lord who loved me so much. Are we together? Do you see? One joy in life, Jesus and his message. If I live, I'm happy. If I don't live, I die. I'm happy. It's all about Jesus. The riches, the blessing, the salvation in Christ. That's why you could say, Philippians 4.4, 4, I tell you, brothers, rejoice in the Lord. Always. Again, I tell you, rejoice 
in the Lord. Have got a handy. Not in physical blessings. They are good. We also rejoice. But those ones, if you compare with what God has done in our life, maybe torture for Paul. And then in Philippians 1, verse 12 and 18, let me read quickly. Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. What happened to him? He means, me being in prison, it has served to advance the gospel. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, I will continue to rejoice. The joy of Paul in prison. He's saying, in other words, if being in prison can somehow help other people or encourage other people to preach Jesus or to spread the gospel, it's fine. I rejoice. If the ministry could be done only because people here are in prison, I rejoice. Are we together? If the ministry could be done just by the fact that I am in prison, I rejoice. And he said, what matters is not me being in prison or any other thing. What matters in my life is that people get to know Jesus. The ministry gets to go on. The gospel is spread. Hallelujah. Do you understand? Do you see his joy? And then in Philippians, the last one, 3, verse 7 and 8, he said something very important. He said, But whatever were against to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the suppressing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through Christ uh, that, which, that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. For Paul, in this paragraph we have read, he talks about what used to be his privileges and advantages. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was a well-known Pharisee. He was circumcised on the eighth, eighth day. You know, those were some advantages or privileges that when people would look at him, they would honor him. It was something very important, like today having a villa or those expensive cars and having a good job. You know, it was almost the same. He had a very high social status. But then he's saying, all those things, I consider them as rubbish. Come on, Paul. Rubbish? Why? Rubbish. They are no longer my joy. No. Even if we... Anyway, he was still... What he was saying he was rubbish. He was a Jew, he was a Hebrew, he was all of that. But for him, being that and having that was rubbish. Why? Because if Paul would compare the immeasurable blessings and riches he has in Christ and then compare it with what, I mean, the social privileges and all that he was and had, 
there was no comparison. No comparison. So I pray that we can, you can understand. But for us, what really matters is what people can see. Do you fit TV, social status, but for Paul, he had all those. His understanding of Jesus and the gospel made him say, if you just say all those rubbish, and his joy was one, Jesus and the gospel. So Paul, who had understood who, the, who this Jesus was and what he has done in his life, in, in our lives, joy in serving the Lord was not an option. It was a must. He was happy because he knew the one he was serving. And he knew what the one he was serving had done in his own life. He knew that was the secret of happiness. That was the secret of happiness. His ministry, his life was all about Jesus and his ministry, spreading the gospel, making people know Christ. That was all. That was his joy. So as we conclude, I'd, I'd, I'd like to ask you some questions and let us reflect a little bit on what we have read. What pushes you? What pushes you to serve? Is it because you are thankful to God, to Jesus, and wants people to know him? Why do you serve? Why do you sing? Why do you do protocol? Why are you a pastor? Why do you do ministry in Mother's Union, Father's Union? What's your motivation? To be seen, to be known, to be honored, to compete, to be blessed. I will come to that. I know that you have been blessed beyond the measure. We have been blessed beyond measure, only that we don't know. So where do you go to get strength, to get joy, to serve the Lord, or to continue to serve the Lord? From Jesus and his gospel? And I hear some people say, they are so motivated by rewards. I don't say rewards are bad. We will be rewarded. No, we will be rewarded. But let me tell you something. Rewards are good and they will be there. I they are not enough to motivate you. Rewards are just like a cherry on the cake. Do you know the cherry? Cherry sur le gâteau. Do you know the cherry? Cerise sur le gâteau. So, rewards are just like a, a, a cherry on the cake. Now, you can't take the cherry and then throw away the, the cake, but you can, you, you enjoy the cake first, and the cherry comes after. But what is more exciting and amazing is the cake, not the cherry. Why? Because, listen to me, what reward can be better than the life of Jesus Christ? He gave you to save you. Is there any? Is there any crowns? 
Nukuri will get rewards. But the rewards do not motivate us. The way, knowing what Jesus has done and knowing the Lord Jesus, do motivate us. And this I say because I see in the life of Paul. Jesus, the gospel, was the motivation, was the strength, was the joy in the life of Paul. And it was the message he was spreading. So it's all about Jesus. So if we want to serve the Lord being happy, our life should be Christ-centered. And our ministry should be gospel-oriented. That's the secret of happiness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hanyuma, nibihembo rgose vizaz. Yes, ashimge? Ibihembo? Vizaz. Amen. Ari kichiru tibihembo cha? Tukwara chivo nye deja. Sibjo? Icho leno nicho chituguruma na amu, nicho chaguruma na gamu ni poro. Kawa na meze humu saz. Hallelujah. These people would be beaten and rejoice because they have been found worthy to be beaten because of the name of Jesus. Can you understand that? Later, if we don't say, have the same joy, being okay, being not in prison and all that, it's because we have not understood yet the secret of joyness. Jesus Christ and the gospel. Hallelujah. So, when our life and ministry are Christ-centered, gospel-oriented, like Paul's, then it will be possible for us to serve the Lord with joy. If this is our life, we will have no time. Competition in Haizabaho. Poro na mwanya ya rafite kuri bja minu bja sabi fuya maso. Nu yu wakwa zibi bji tiri uyu, iyu, uyu. No. There is a greater message to talk about. There are greater things to talk about and to worry about. Those cheap, cheap stuff. He had no time for that. Christ-centered. Gospel-oriented. Yes, Abba Mugisha. So I'd like to pray this way. We've been talking about joy in Jesus Christ. And maybe you are here today. And this message is completely strange to you. You don't understand what we're talking about. Because you have not yet experienced this Jesus. And I plead with you, if he's knocking at the, heart, the door of your heart today, please raise your hand. And I'll pray with you. He will forgive you, change your life, and he will bless you indeed. If you are there, don't be afraid. Don't be... Please raise your hand. If you are there, raise your hand. Hallelujah. Nobody. So... I want to pray for us Christians, because I guess all of us are Christians. We are called to rejoice, and we are called to serve the Lord with this joy. But as I said, the joy is based on understanding who Christ is and what he has done into our life. So I don't know how you are doing. Maybe you've been serving the Lord and you feel exhausted and there's no joy in serving. Oh, no joy in your life. Ariko, this morning, God is also giving us, again, giving us an opportunity to tell him, here we are, Lord. Maybe we've messed up. Maybe we've come with the wrong motivations and motives and we have done wrong things. He's giving us an opportunity to say, sorry, Lord. We are sorry, Lord. Just give us the joy the way he gave it to, to Paul. Because it was God in the life of Paul doing that. So I want to pray with you. Those in ministry, even if your life does not have joy, 
I want to pray with you. And I'm going to pray using a scripture. This is how I was led. A, a prayer that Paul prayed for Ephesians. I like it because um, and I will ask you to join me as I pray this prayer and believe the Lord we do something in our hearts. Amen. Let's pray. It's in Ephesians 3, if you want to, 14, 21. For this reason, we kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven on the earth derives its name. We pray that out of your glorious riches, you may strengthen us with power through your spirit in our inner being, so that Christ may, de may dwell in our hearts through faith. And we pray that we being rooted and established in love, we may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide, how long, how high, how deep is the love of Christ for us. And to know this love that suppresses knowledge that we may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to you, who is able to do measurably more all we can ask or imagine, according to your power that is at work with us, within us. To you, God, be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.